Welcome everyone to my coffee lecture. So science is based on reproducibility. A scientific fact can only be established if we have a reproducible procedure to verify it. Sometimes there is a distinction between reproducibility and repeatability. Repeatability can be used as a weaker form of reproducibility. So a definition might be that an experiment can be repeated under the same conditions by the same person using the same instruments for repeatability and for reproducibility. A reproducible experiment can be replicated anywhere by anyone following the same procedure, which is then documented in literature. Obviously, this distinction doesn't make sense for all topics because for some topics, research is standardized to such an extent that we would always assume that the stronger reproducibility requirement is true. Okay, so if we have a scientific result which is published in literature and which is not reproducible, what happens with it? For, it, for this, we take a look at the publication life cycle. So we start with the scientific result, then we write a manuscript. The manuscript goes then into peer review. And in peer review, usually there is no full check for reproducibility. One exception can be mathematical proofs. There you can fully check the whole proof, but for experimental results, usually there is only a consistency checks Reviewer can ask questions, but that's it. So once this important check is passed, then we have a scientific publication and everybody can in principle use this result. However, what mostly happens to this publication is that nobody's interested or nobody tries to reproduce it. In some cases, there is a reproduction attempt of the result and everything is fine if the result can be reproduced. If it cannot be reproduced, obviously the question arises why. So the first thing would be to check for own mistakes and maybe you can find the mistake and reproduce the result. If not, one option might be to contact the author of the paper and then maybe you find a mistake, he finds a mistake and he can publish a correction or retract the paper, or you can prepare a known publication about the new finding. So you can publish the fact that there is an issue with reproducibility. And then in these two cases, the information that the original result is not reproducible is then found in scientific literature. However, these two routes are unfortunately very rarely taken. Most of the time, if you are here, you are not able to reproduce the results, you stop here and you don't try in any more depth to reproduce the results. And so somebody else can do the same and waste a lot of time by trying again to reproduce the same result. So this is obviously a problem. Another possibility uh, apart from the traditional publication routes, which has been established in recent years is post-publication peer review. So there are several platforms now allowing reviewing and commenting on published papers. The most popular one is the peer platform, which I show here. Uh, in this platform, you can comment on any paper you just need a unique identifier, like a digital object identifier, and then you can start a discussion. Comments can be made anonymously, which uh, has raised some discussions, but obviously it makes it easier to start a discussion. And you can address major issues of a paper or minor issues, and the authors are alerted automatically if there are comments on their paper. 
That obviously only applies if the contact information in the original paper is still up to date. This form of post-publication peer review has been used to find problems with reproducibility and other issues uh, within recent years and was quite in successful in showing some of the problems in specific papers. So it's an option to keep in mind if you have doubts about certain details of a paper or reproducibility altogether. Okay, so how big of a problem is reproducibility? Is there a reproducibility crisis? This question was asked in a nature survey in 2016 to 1,500 scientists, and 52% agreed there is a significant crisis in reproducibility. However, less than a third think that non-reproducible results are wrong, which means that people rather think that there are issues with standardization, documentation, and so on. And most scientists still trust published literature. Obviously, you don't have any other choice since you need the literature as a basis of your own work. Then also they have asked scientists if they had failed to reproduce an experiment. And this has happened in almost every area of science. And differences are not that large. And some researchers even have attempted to publish an unsuccessful reproduction attempt, but this is notoriously difficult. So oftentimes this just doesn't enter literature as I showed before. Now we have a look at two examples where there were systematic studies of reproducibility. First, we start with a topic where you might think it's very easy to reproduce results. And this is computer science. Here, this is a study on reproducibility of building computer code on specific operating systems. So they first checked for 580 papers whether they could obtain the code and then whether they could build it. So it's not a very high requirement, uh, but still, as you can see, it failed in many cases. So I will explain this in more details. They first selected uh, 601 papers and excluded some of them, either because they were not backed by code or they didn't have the specific hardware or they had overlapping author lists. So we are left with four and two papers. And then we have two groups for this group here, 226 papers, the code could be obtained. Either it was directly linked in the articles, it was found somewhere on the web, or it was obtained by emailing the author. And by this group, 176 papers, the code could not be obtained because either the authors didn't respond to the email or they said that they cannot share the code. So for this chair here where the code was obtained, not all of them could be built. So in nine cases, the build completely failed. In 130 cases, the system could be built in less than 30 minutes, in 64 cases, in more than 30 minutes, and in the rest, they tried to build it, but uh, failed. But the author of the paper said that the code could be built. So even with this relatively weak requirement, and in this area where reproduction should reproduction should be re relatively easy, there are already significant problems. So let's have a look at an area uh, where reproducibility is more of an issue, and this is cancer biology. There has been a huge reproducibility project. It's called the Reproducibility Project in Cancer Biology. There have been a number of publications on the project in eLife Sciences. 
In total, 50 experiments from 23 high-profile papers were repeated. Uh, data about the replicability of a total of 158 effects were generated, and the overall success rate of replication was 46%. Now, how is this success rate defined? The success was defined by five criteria. You can see this here in the graph, uh, divided into original positive results and original null results. This is inconclusive results. The reproduction on originally inconclusive results was uh, more successful overall, which is probably not surprising. Um, but here, as you can see, in many cases, they failed in all five criteria. And overall, it was counted as a success if more than three criteria were successful. The criteria themselves were direction and statistical significance um, could be reproduced. The original effect size in a replication 95% confidence interval uh, replication effect size in an original 95% prediction interval, and then a meta-analysis combining original replica uh, and replication effect sizes was still statistically significant. In these cases, the results are probably not really wrong. They are just problems with standardization, problem with documentation, and general problems with reproducing uh, the same result with different materials by a different person and so on. However, there are also cases where it can be established that published results are wrong. And in these cases, the paper is retracted. So here in these two graphs, I show the trends in paper retraction. I could unfortunately not find a combined graph over the whole time period. Therefore, you have two graphs here. Uh, this one goes from 1977 to 2011, and this one goes from 2013 to uh, 2021. In both cases, you can see that we have an overall increase in paper retractions. And uh, here you can see they try to split it into different causes for retraction. So there is fraud, errors, plagiarism, duplicate publication, and fraud or suspected fraud is a really common cause of paper retractions. But obviously errors and plagiarism also play a role. So these are the cases where we can clearly establish mistakes in published literature. What is the reason for uh, these rather common problems with reproducibility. So there are a lot of structural reasons why these problems exist. And maybe the most important one is the publisher parish culture in academia. Scientists have to spend a lot of time publishing, much more than spending time developing research. There is usually no time for confirmation of experiments. Uh, there is limited time for peer review and only 45% of articles published in 4,500 scientific journals are cited within the first five years. Only 42% of the papers receive more than one citations and five to 25 of these are self-cites. So in brief, much of the literature is never reviewed or uh, there is no replication attempt by anyone. How can you keep track of retractions? Well, if you have one specific publication where you want to know if it has been retracted, you can just check in the journal. There should be a note if it's retracted or a note of an erratum if there have been errors corrected. But there is also as an additional option a database where you can search for authors, for titles, uh, and so on, and check whether they have retracted papers or 
whether there is a rejected paper with a specific title. This is a really useful resource. And in addition to this database, they also have a blog where they uh, write about uh, retraction stories and uh, notable cases of retractions and so on. And one of the most interesting resources on this page, uh, on this web page is a list of the most cited retracted papers. They usually have a top 10 there. I show the top three here as uh, beginning of this year. This always changes, obviously. So for each of these papers, we have the retraction year, the total sites, the citing articles before retraction, and the citing articles after retraction. I think the citing article after articles after retraction, this is a really interesting phenomenon since there is a significant number of articles citing this paper still after retraction. And this means that many authors don't ever check back on many of the papers they cite. So once they have it on their citation list, they will just cite it again in the next paper without checking whether there has been any retraction or correction and so on. It's clearly something to avoid. So what can we do in general to improve reproducibility? A provocative suggestion has been money back guarantee for non-reproducible results. This is maybe not the best idea or not the easiest to put in practice. However, what is important and where everyone can contribute is that it's important to uh, make the description of results and method as detailed as possible, then uh, share code and data as much as possible and adhere to the principle of open science. Uh, but obviously for a substantial change in the reproducibility problem, structural incentives would need to be changed, but maybe this is also a topic uh, to discuss afterwards. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.